Uh, for more insight on what we're seeing out there in the retail space, we're joined now by Carl Littler of the Retail Council of Canada. Carl, thanks for joining us. And right away, I want to ask you, what are you hearing from your membership as yet another rent day rolls in? Well, obviously, a significant amount of uh, concern as uh, yet another one kicks over. Um, obviously, in some cases, we've had members who are starting to reopen, uh, reopening more broadly in most parts of the country. Obviously, there are still some exceptions. Um, but of course, that doesn't affect uh, mall tenants who are still essentially shuttered in, in much of the country. And, and even with some reopening, of course, you, you need consumer confidence, both in their own economic circumstance and in the public health situation. So it's going to take a while before the income flow is such that people will be able to pay their rent on a timely basis. Now, of course, Ottawa has put a program in place that has been widely criticized because if you're going to get rent relief as a retailer, as a tenant, it's all contingent on the landlord agreeing. What are you hearing from your membership on that as well? I know a lot of people worry that their landlord just wouldn't take part. Yeah, I think the program conceptually is a pretty good design. A 75% of your rent is a pretty significant form of assistance, but of course, it does, require, it does take buy-in from the landlord. And uh, although certainly some landlords are taking it up, uh, certainly more enlightened ones, um, we're still hearing that there's a significant resistance in the landlord community. And, and from our view, that's very short-sighted uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, not least uh, the medium and long-term economic interests of those landlords probably suggest that they want to keep their tenants in being. Yeah, the Prime Minister, I mean, he's talked along those lines that you're talking about as well, Carl, saying it is in the best interest to get, you know, some of your rent instead of none of it from your tenant. I understand, though, when you talk to your membership at the Retail Council, 48% saying they've not been able to pay their rent at all, and 34% saying that their landlords have threatened to either change the locks or evict them as a tenant. This is not what Ottawa was hoping to hear or see out there. No, it's certainly not what the expectation was. And, and we're having a little trouble really understanding the landlord's perspective. I mean, I'm not going to demonize landlords. There are landlords with particular situations that may, may be challenging in this case, and they have their own covenants and they have their own debt instruments and so on. But, I mean, this is a situation in which the very thing that the landlord contracts for, which is the physical space that they, they give to tenants in order to uh, have tenants operate, has, of course, been shut in many cases by public order, is often impaired either directly by, by rules or, or by public confidence. So the very thing you're renting uh, to the tenant is, uh, is somehow fettered, and yet some landlords seem to be oblivious to that fact, and their view is cash on, cash on the barrel head on time. Thank you very much. Now, the government's put a lot of programs in place, and one that's been particularly fascinating to me is the handoff, at least that they're trying to engineer in Ottawa, between the CERB, which of course was the, the idea, get the money out to the people who need it right away. You don't want anyone to lose the roof over your head. You don't want people to go without food on the table. But the uh, the whole idea was that they would migrate. People would migrate from the CERB as more and more companies took advantage of the wage subsidy to get them back on the private payroll. They have cut the uh, the budget for the wage subsidy uh, by tens of billions of dollars because it wasn't being taken up and putting money back into the CERB. Is there a real problem here in terms of getting the economy going? If we can't get these people back to work? Yeah, look, I mean, there's two parts to the CERB, really. There's CERB for people who really need it. And, you know, that's for people who are obviously on, on uh, you know, suffer from COVID-19 or caregivers. Obviously, there's a significant situation with schools and daycare and, and so forth not being in session. And so CERB was envisaged for that. But, you know, obviously, CERB was also um, intended to cover people for who had lost their jobs, uh, in consequence, or had deep reductions in hours in consequence of uh, of COVID-19, but it, it seems maybe that it's become a bit more than that. And obviously, we don't want CERB to be a safe harbor for people for whom there is work available who don't otherwise have any have any particular reason to refuse that work. Um, it's going to take a while, frankly, to do that transition. I will say this: the wage subsidy is the crown jewel of the federal programs. Obviously, it's the most expensive program, or was envisaged to be. Um, and they're thinking about the second wave of that now. We think it's pretty critical that that be a recovery-focused vehicle. Um, and obviously, if you have a hard notch at 70% uh, at of your prior income, it's a bit hard to make it a recovery vehicle. We think the federal government has heard that loud and clear and, and in its own design work is thinking about something that works better for the recovery. So obviously, we're hoping to see the next phase of, uh, of uh, the, the wage subsidy program, which goes at least until August 29th. Uh, we would like to hear how uh, the federal government is going to work through the CERB uh, issue. 
I, I presume that at some point, if there are offers of jobs available and people decline them, and they don't have one of the sort of core reasons for, for not uh, showing up for work, then the federal government's going to make some moves to actually start to wean people off their yeah, sort of a getting into the employment insurance kind of scheme that we were used to before. Well, only about a minute left, but I did want to ask you in terms of retailers reopening. Obviously, they worry about their personal safety. Is there enough personal protective equipment out there for retailers to outfit their stores to protect themselves? Well, look, I, we've had a lot of, you know, experience in this in grocery and pharmacy and, and in some parts of the country, obviously much broader uh, sort of essential retail. So, there's some fairly rationalized supply chains at this point. I think for a new, somebody coming back on stream, opening up bricks and mortar for the first time, a lot of it is really about doing the sourcing of that and, and figuring that out as an issue. So I think there's adequate supply of most uh, items that are available. It's more a matter of making sure that as you're a retailer that's reopening, that you've got a bead on, on the right sources um, and that, you know, obviously you can keep up and that you understand the protocols because people are not obviously used to uh, this environment if they've been shuttered for two months or more. Carl, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for your insight. Very welcome. Thanks. Carl Littler of the Retail Council of Canada. Now